everyone, thanks for that kind introduction, Dean. And I uh, do want to ask, you know, I think I know what all those decorations stand for. Can I get that case of champagne? <laughs> but I must say that the, uh, you know, the Queen's English somehow makes a generous remark sound a bit grander than it. It's probably justified, but I appreciate it just the same. Beyond that, though, given the city we're in, I do want to establish a small point of order before I begin this evening. Uh, we may actually have, have a few members of Parliament here tonight, and I'm indeed honored by that. I also know that we have time for questions later. Now, I've seen what happens during pre Prime Minister's question time. <laughs> in truth, the broadcast of Prime Minister's question time is widely watched and much enjoyed on American public television. There's something about it that appeals to Americans. Perhaps it's the take-no-prisoners rhetoric that we former colonials enjoy. In fact, among British topics of interest in the United States, Prime Minister's Question Time probably ranks a close third in appeal to us, given that we are, of course, first and foremost fascinated by any and all stories about British royalty, and second, by any and all accounts of your wonderfully newsworthy and delightfully colorful London mayor. <laughs> In any event, if this evening's question and answer period is going to become similar to Prime Minister's question time, I'd like to know that up front so that I can just keep talking until the time for questions has expired. <laughs> I seem to recall seeing that strategy employed during Prime Minister's question time once or twice. Well, it is a great honor to be here as a guest of the Policy Exchange in the heart of this great city, and it's humbling to look out at such a distinguished audience uh, to see all of you who have gathered this evening. Uh, Lord Guthrie of Craigie Bank, I would think I knew him when he was merely Sir Charles. <laughs> We're fascinated by this royalty stuff. <laughs> but where in the world is Craigie Bank, you know? <laughs> Whatever happened to El Alamein or something like that? <laughs> well, members of parliament, ministers, commissioners, chief constables, fellow soldiers, especially Major General Andrew Mackay, who we jokingly refer to as the King of Scotland, the commander of the Scottish division with whom I was privileged to serve in Iraq and who commanded a Scottish brigade with distinction in Afghanistan, and many prominent and distinguished members of the Fourth Estate and the security community in attendance tonight. It is, again, a special privilege to join all of you to deliver the fourth Colin Cranbarn Memorial Lecture. And I hope you appreciate the significance of a U.S. Army general officer giving a speech unaided by a laser pointer and, and PowerPoint slides. You may, in fact, be witnessing an event that is relatively unprecedented recent U.S. military history, but the slides are loaded for the question and answer period. Well, we're here in part, of course, to remember Colin. Uh, it is, after all, the memory of his service and of the character of that service in Northern Ireland and West Yorkshire and a number of other places that brings us together tonight and provides an occasion for us to extend his legacy. Indeed, when I did a bit of research about Colin, I must confess that I saw what seemed to me to be a kindred spirit. I was particularly taken by the reference one of his supervisors provided when Colin was considered for the position of Deputy Chief Constable of what was then the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Well, Colin's boss wrote, if you want a deputy who will give you an easy life, who will give you peace, and who will leave you alone, Colin is not. I suspect that some of my old bosses may have provided similar assessments of the view at various times as well. But tonight we'd do well to focus on an important theme that Colin used to emphasize, that while every location is different, all locations are nonetheless connected. Colin's insight, of course, was to notice the link between those two realities. First, if all locations are different, local knowledge is obviously critical. But if, as he also contended, the fate of one location often depends on the destiny of another, then individual actions are important, not just in their locales, but for the whole event. This insight was really almost John Donne-esque, if you will, akin to John Donne's observation that no man is an island. And the implication is significant. Our security as a whole is linked to the 
the security of our parks, and the security of our parks depends on the whole. Again, a key insight in the increasing reality of the onset of globalization. In fact, those of us engaged in counterinsurgency operations in recent years have emphasized similar points, recognizing the importance of nuanced understandings of local situations, but also underscoring the importance of getting the big ideas and the big trends right as well. In essence, the distance between the tactical and strategic levels of our activities have been compressed considerably, with the activities at one level likely to affect the situations in the other as well. In view of the important insights by Colin, and as I mentioned earlier, the character of his work, his legacy does indeed matter. And I too want to thank his wife Lynn, Colin's sister Vicki, and Colin's son Edward for being here to help us recall the importance of Colin's work and to help us keep that legacy intact. There has been, perhaps by design, a logical progression of topics in successive Trampon lectures. In 2006, the head of the Metropolitan Police Counterterrorism Command, Peter Clark, emphasized the local components of counterterrorism with respect to policing. He concluded, as Colin had before him, that the problem of counterterrorism had simply grown too large for just the local police forces in the UK to address, and as others also recognized the validity of this observation, regional policing cells were established. But the regional cells also needed longer tentacles. So earlier this year, the Director General of the Office for Security and Counterterrorism in the Home Office, Charles Barr, extended the argument abroad calling for true international cooperation in the fight against terrorism and highlighting the link between counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, a link that Central Command recognizes explicitly as well as Barr explained. In many ways, my remarks tonight naturally follow those of earlier lectures, for I'll agree strongly with what those before me have proposed, that no problem can be viewed in isolation, and that indeed many of the challenges that confront the United States and America's military are connected to many of your challenges and to various organizations in the UK. And the same is true for our many other partners, of course, as well. What our coalition forces are doing in the Central Command of Responsibility complements the work that local and regional police forces are doing in the US, UK, and other coalition force nations, not to mention in the nations of our partners so as I discuss the challenges that we all face in the Central Command area of responsibility, I think it's reasonable to assert that Colin would have agreed that to the degree that extremists and hostile states are successful, even in far-flung locales, the security of all our nations is more important. With that in mind, I want to structure my remarks this evening in three parts. First, I'll provide a quick overview of the Central Command area of responsibility, or AOR, the American acronym phrase goes. Then I'll talk about our approach in the region and describe the principles that have led us to implement, to varying degrees in different areas, a comprehensive whole of government's counterinsurgency strategy. And lastly, I'll describe briefly the situations in several of the countries and subregions in our AOR. So let me start by taking a moment to describe the Central Command. The region consists of 20 countries, from Egypt in the west to Pakistan in the east, Kazakhstan in the north, to Yemen, and the waters off Somalia in the south. This audience recognizes well, I know, that this region sits astride the traditional land of former empires, and the pull of ancient tensions can still be felt in many areas of the region. The AOR includes some 530 million people from at least 22 major ethnic groups who speak 18 major languages and ascribe to at least four major religions and innumerable others. The area is rich in oil and natural gas, but poor in fresh water. It has countries with the highest per capita income in the world and others that rank in the lowest five. In 18 of the 20 states, young people between the ages of 15 and 29 constitute over 40% of the population, and economic opportunities for many of them are insignificant. 